Um, so we're going to start the presentation now. So thank you everybody for coming to our talk. Today we're going to be talking to you about a case study on how designers can shape better documentation. So we call the study Reimagining K-Native. So a little bit about who we are. My name is Zainab and I am currently a UX design researcher at OCAD University from Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm also one of the design leads for the new K-Native UX working group. So this is a fairly new group. We began in September, and we've done a lot of um, exciting projects that we're excited to talk to you guys about today. Um, I also have a background in human-computer interactions, and I've been involved in design education at OCAD for the past two years. Uh, all right, hello everyone. I'm Mariana Mejia. I'm also a UX researcher at the same lab Zainab is at at OCAD University. Um, I'm the other design lead at the UX working group, and I'm finishing my final semester in the industrial design program at OCAD. Um, and some of my interests include accessible design, uh, human computer interaction, and authoring tool design. So before we get into the guts of our presentation, we wanted to give you a roadmap and give you an idea of the questions that you should have answered by the end of these slides. So the three main questions are what, why, and how. So first of all, we're going to cover what is K-Native and just so that you know like what the documentation we are restructuring is. Next, we're going to give you an overview of what UX design is, uh, since I'm assuming most of you do not have a design background. And we're going to be covering some like buzzword topics, like for example, how to make something more intuitive or user friendly. We're also going to be covering why. So why might you want to explore UX strategies for your own projects and why you might want to think about involving designers in your open source tools. Lastly, we want you to consider how. So, how can you actually implement these UX strategies in your own projects? So an example we're gonna show you is card sorting. And lastly, how can you actually go about finding designers for your open source projects? Right, so first getting into what is Knative. Knative is an automation layer um, that you can use with Kubernetes to deploy native Kubernetes services. So it has three components. The first component is functions. So this is a simple programming model uh, that allows you to easily create and deploy your own event-driven functions. We also have, oh, sorry, <laughs> we also have serving, which allows you to deploy and run containers. And lastly, we have eventing, which enables uh, different events to trigger container-based services. So three uh, primitives or components. And um, so why might you want to use Knative? Uh, so the benefit of using Knative is that it allows you to automate things. So there's less of a need. So if you were to use Kubernetes by itself, you'd have to set up the complex infrastructure. And by using Knative, you as a developer can focus more on your own code. It also has less resource consumption. So Knative is able to start and stop instances automatically as needed. And lastly, there is auto scaling. So you only pay for the compute time that you need. So it is gonna be cheaper. Okay, so we've covered uh, the tool that we're talking about today. And now we wanna talk about why open source has a need for user-centered design. So in many cases, the developers are not the only users of the tools. And while in the past, the uh, groups of the developers and the users were the same group, but um, as software has developed and software has taken over many industries, as you guys know, uh, the end users of open source are not only experts, and we want to be considering this gap here. The users that are not ex- oh. There's no, there's no cursor, but <laughs> there's this, this circle on the left, um, the bigger circle, um, which shows that not all developers are users. Okay, so now we're gonna give an overview of what UX design is. So our goal as, a desi as designers is to both understand and improve the experience between a user and a product or service. So the big question you wanna answer is, how can we make the entire experience more intuitive or user-friendly? And I also wanna point out that UX design is an umbrella term that covers a variety of topics. So a lot of people might hear UX design and think it's only about the interface, but it's actually um, much deeper than that. We also do things like 
how people uh, navigate a tool, how you can structure and organize your information. We consider things like accessibility of tools, and we also do things like user research and user testing to ensure that all the features are, are actually what people want. Okay, so going back to this word that I keep using um, and that you've probably heard before, so what, what makes something intuitive? There's a typo on the slide, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so how can we actually design our tools to be more intuitive or user-friendly? There's basically uh, two aspects to this. The first aspect is leveraging a user's prior knowledge. So I'll give an example of a command line interface. So for example, you have a user and they use a command line interface where the components are in a specific order. And say you have a new product and the components of the command are in a different order, the user is not going to be very happy because this goes against their prior knowledge. So you want to be designing tools in a way that is familiar to what the user has used before and you want to follow certain conventions that are common. Um, and, and so in order to figure out what's common, you have to kind of know who the user is and what their experience is, right? So that's where the user research part comes in. And the second part is considering human instinct or common sense. So an example of this in visual design is where if you have an important piece of information like the title, you should be using a larger font or using a contrasting text as the eye will intuitively be drawn to this and perceive this as the most important piece of information. And um, like I mentioned, these uh, design decisions often need to be researched and need to be tested to ensure that your product is actually following these two principles. Okay, so now we're gonna get into what the design process is. So the de design process has five stages and the first stage is to empathize with the user. So you wanna start off with a broad understanding of the user's needs. So while you can hypothesize um, what the user's needs might be, you don't really know unless you go out and ask people. So this is where you're doing things like observations and surveys. The second stage is to define the problem. So once you've collected all your data and information, you can now begin to narrow down and define the problem space. And once you've figured out what the precise problem is, then you can begin to ideate solutions. So sometimes we as engineers tend to jump to the ideate step, but we wanna make sure we're really putting emphasis on the first two steps, which are more of um, induction. So in the ID8 phase, actually, um, in our Knative working group, we end up working a lot with the technical team to come up with potential solutions uh, to the problems we've um, identified. And after you've uh, come up with potential solutions, you can begin to prototype solutions. And this is where you might start using tools like Figma to design um, a potential solution. And then you can start doing, uh, getting into developer handoff. And once you've done all that, you can start testing things. So you can um, show people what you've made and get some user feedback on that. And that is st stage five. Okay, so a bit of an overview of how um, designers can help open source. Basically, um, we want our tools to be benefiting as many people as possible. So I have this diagram here showing the positive feedback loop of, how you, of why UX design is important. So first, if you have more emphasis on design, you're gonna end up with tools that are easier to access. Tools that are easier to access result in more people using your tools. And the more users you have, the more likely you are to have more contributors. So it just is a cycle that we wanna keep continuing, right? And here are some more ways um, that designers have been uh, beneficial in Knative. So now more of our uh, decisions are user-driven, which means that the new features and tools that we add um, follow, or hopefully <laughs> are following user demand. So the features that we develop um, are actually gonna be used by people. Um, next, um, by having better information design, we're able to have more efficient onboarding for both contributors and new users. So an example of information design is our documentation restructuring, which Mariana will be going over in a second. And lastly, we wanna focus on things like product improvement for existing products. So for example, um, for our command line interface, we were looking at ways to make it um, more intuitive or user-friendly using the principles I described previously. So here's where we're, we are analyzing and improving um, our existing products. 
Okay, so hopefully by now um, you um, are thinking about how you might be able to involve designers in your own products, but there are still a couple challenges. So while developers may be aware that better design could be beneficial, they may not always know the specific strategies that are helpful for their own projects. And they may not always know which ones to implement and how to implement them. And lastly, um, there are a lot of terms um, that may, they may not be able to articulate to designers. So we hope that during the rest of this presentation, we're able to address some of these concerns. All right, so that brings us to our specific case study that we're talking about today, uh, which is, have you ever been stuck in documentation hell? Let's say you're trying to look for a specific feature within pages and pages in documentation, and you can't seem to find it. Um, or maybe you yourself are a maintainer of a specific open source project, and you develop a feature and they tell you, okay, now put it in the documentation. And you're like, okay, but where does that fit? Um, this exercise is kind of meant to help you figure those kinds of questions out. Um, so we'll start by contextualizing a bit here. Um, this is the Knative website, specifically under the eventing page, and we were approached by um, maintainers from the eventing working group at Knative to kind of examine this substructure that's towards the left. Um, and see like if there were any usability issues or UX improvements that we could make to it. This is just highlighting the submenu that I was referring to. Okay, so um, this is actually a difficulty with information architecture. Um, over here, you can see towards the left column, um, there's like the unexpanded version of the submenu and then to the right, there's the expanded version. Um, there's a lot of categories underneath this and a lot to go through. Um, and so we want to figure out how to structure this information. So what is information architecture? Um, it's kind of like a sub-discipline within UX design where you're trying to present information to the user in a way that's understandable, easy to find, um, and that makes sense on like an intuitive level. Um, and it categorizes and presents relevant information. Um, so for this issue that we have presented, what specific UX research strategies are there? So there's a couple of research strategies uh, within UX design, some of which you may have heard of or done yourself. Um, there's things like surveys and interviews, um, but there's also more specific ones like co-design where you're designing with your end users. Um, or you're doing digital ethnography, which comes out of anthropology, and it can be thought of as like noting people's behaviors, say on like online forums, for example. Um, you can also do things like diary studies where you ask a user to maybe interact with your design and write down their own notes on how they feel during the interaction and analyze that. But luckily, there is a specific UX research strategy that is meant for information architecture. Um, this is called card sorting, and um, it really helps you understand a mental model of how your users understand the information on your website or your specific project. Um, so it helps you answer questions like, how do people categorize different pieces of information? What pieces of information are related in their minds? What's more important? What's least important? Um, things of the sort. So this is just a very quick example on how to apply card sorting, um, just to like kind of onboard you to the idea. Um, let's say you're a designer at Microsoft Teams. The Teams interface has not been invented. You know that you want something like time since beginning of the meeting, a leave button, a mute toggle button, and um, maybe a video toggle button. But that's really all you know. So you can write all of these down into sticky notes or cards and give them to end users and see how they categorize things. So you might get a result like they might group together the mute toggle button and the video toggle button. And they might place an emphasis on the leave button and less of an emphasis on the uh, time since beginning of the meeting. And they might even tell you something like, you're missing a chat feature. So you actually 
once you analyze those results, uh, you actually get something that ends up looking like the navigation bar on the team's interface. So you might find that people place more emphasis on the leave button, so you make it red, bold, easy to find. Um, less of an emphasis on the time since beginning of the meeting, so you put it off to the left in less bold lettering. Um, and then you put together the camera toggle and the mute toggle because they're conceptually related. Um, so that's a bit of like how you might translate that into a graphical user interface. So going back to our original issue of confusing documentation, um, how did we even get here? So as you might already know, um, you might like develop a feature within the open source project and um, not know where to put it. So this is a common issue that also happens in Knative where people maybe um, categorize things in a way where most people wouldn't think to find them. And the end result is that it's hard for contributors to find the specific feature, it's hard for end users, um, and it's hard for maintainers to kind of keep up with the whole documentation and its structure. So um, we were looking at the following questions. What subtle changes can we make to this left side menu uh, so that it's more navigable? Um, we also had some more specific questions surrounding um, two topics of developer topics and administrator topics, which are kind of like sandwiched in the middle here. Uh, we wanted to find out whether or not people actually use them to understand um, and like find the specific thing they're looking for within the Knative documentation. Um, and we also wanted to find what other main categories do people use? Um, like what should be up here and what could we do without? So actually at the last KubeCon, the wonderful people at Knative that um, volunteered to be at the booth conducted this study um, and uh, yeah, we had a total of 25 participants. This is a bit of what some of the boards look like. Um, it's just like a poster board with sticky notes and the information found on the left submenu, kind of like abstracted out of the interface. Um, and over here we have like a funny thing that I like to call the corner of shame, uh, which is pointed out at the bottom right hand corner. Um, it's just like a little corner where people can put sticky notes that they don't think are relevant. Uh, and I'll get into a bit more of why that's useful. So how do you analyze card sorting? We did more of a quantitative approach to the um, card sorting data. So we were trying to look at frequency of like what were, like let's say the frequency of um, administrator topics and um, how much it was used to categorize other groups um, and what topics were frequently grouped together. This is just a bit of um, what the analysis looked like in the images. Okay, so back to our original questions. Um, do people really use a distinction between administrator and developer topics? Um, in our specific use case, the answer was yes. Um, it was actually the two top used categories that people used to make sense of what was in the left submenu. Um, followed by observability and resources. Um, and were there any categories that people could do without? The answer is yes, they actually erased something called, uh, it's a bit nested, but it's called the sugar controller. Um, and that's interesting because we hypothesize it was due to a lack of information. Like people don't necessarily know what a sugar controller is, therefore they didn't know how to categorize it and therefore they put it in the corner of shame. Um, then we had some emerging questions. We had other emerging questions besides this one, but maybe this one was the most important. Um, were there specific, specific pieces of information that people categorized under administrator or developer topics? And the answer was there was no, um, I guess, significant overlap um, between the different boards and like how people categorize them, but there were somewhat consistent broad themes. So under administrator topics, you could find things like collecting, observing, um, configuring. Meanwhile, under developer topics, you could find things like troubleshooting. Um, and what were the final results for, like what changes we made to the actual interface? Um, so to make a long story short, um, 
we made, we remade, um, renamed some topics. Uh, we moved other topics around. So, uh, for example, we moved up the resources and the developer topics and administrator topics because uh, we found those were relevant. Uh, we made some visual changes. And because of the sugar controller, we thought to add um, frequently asked questions for, to, in order to fill in that kind of educational gap um, that we found. Um, so where else could you use card sorting? Is it only okay for documentation? And the answer is no. It's really good for anything that has information in it, which is, I would dare to say, all interfaces. Um, so you can use it for the navigation bar on your website. You can use it to figure out the graphical user interface of your project. Um, you can even use it to structure a command line to understand what um, like structure for the command lines and what order makes most sense to people. Um, and really any other information architecture issues. So hopefully you're interested in conducting your own card sorting exercise. And how do you do that? Um, so this is a bit biased towards how we did it. Uh, there's actually many different types of card sorting exercises, um, which I won't bore you with today, but I would be happy to talk about it um, some other time. Um, but yeah, uh, you just have to like get the supplies. You can do this digitally with platforms that kind of imitate whiteboard layouts or sticky notes. Um, this includes things like Miro, Mural, um, and FigJam, if you guys have ever used those platforms. Um, but for in-person exercises, you just need the poster board and the sticky notes. And um, for the second step, you just write down whatever categories or pieces of information you want to understand onto the sticky notes. Um, and this is actually a very important part. When you're placing those sticky notes on the board, be sure to randomly put them there. Otherwise, you're kind of biasing the way uh, you want people to like place the sticky notes. Um, like you don't want to like indicate how you think it should go. Um, and as an option, you can add blank sticky notes so that if people think there's like a conceptual gap missing, for example, that chat feature that we were talking about in Microsoft Teams, um, you know what you're missing in your interface. Uh, that can. I would also highly encourage, if you can, ask questions as to why they think it's missing. Um, and then as an option, you can add the corner of shame. It also provides some very useful information as to what people think is like extra information or maybe they don't know what it is. Um, again, it's very uh, interesting pieces of data. Um, and then obviously you contact participants. Uh, it can be a bit tricky to source participants sometimes. But yeah, once you do, be sure to follow ethical guidelines, gain their consent, uh, things of the sort. And I would also highly recommend getting a video, if you can, of the participant sorting out the um, cards so that you can kind of see their rationale. Like, what decisions did they go back on? Um, what did they have trouble placing? That can tell you a lot of things. Um, and lastly, uh, analyze. It's kind of easier said than done, and you can do it in a variety of ways. Um, but yeah, look at what hierarchies exist. What do people place as categories the most? What patterns are there in the data? Um, and be sure to be responsible with the data collected. Um, and if you're sharing findings, please anonymize the findings, um, unless you have explicit consent to not do so. Um, and then, Try to analyze those results. This is where having a designer really helps. Um, try to translate those results from the card sorting into uh, whatever interface that you're making. Um, so you can place like highly relevant things as more visually important. So like maybe add some more contrast, make it bolder. Um, for less relevant pieces of information, you can like minimize them, push them off to the side. Um, things of the sort, uh, consider adding new information where people thought it was missing. Um, and then lastly, share the findings. Um, obviously it's open source, so it's always great to share with the broader community um, and get some feedback from subject matter experts in your specific project um, and implement it. 
Um, okay, so now we're going to be covering some of the challenges that we faced during this card sorting exercise. So the first challenge was to figure out how to actually find Knative users to interview. So our solution was to do it at KubeCon because a lot of people come here. Uh, so this was at the last KubeCon and um, although we did get 25 participants, um, we're thinking that in the future it might be good to also have a digital version of this so that uh, people that are international or people that aren't present at KubeCon physically could also be able to participate. So that's one way that we can actually um, improve our sample size. And uh, one of the other issues that we had was that the volunteers that were running the study and also the participants did not have a prior example of how this type of... Uh, study is run. So um, it would be, it would have been good to kind of inform, inform the volunteers about guiding questions or um, tell them to like write down more notes as the study was being done. And this leads us to the third part, uh, third issue, which was a lack of context in analyzing. So me and Mariana were <laughs> analyzing the uh, study results from the photos. Uh, but unfortunately, because it was already anonymized, we did not have a way to ask any follow-up questions to get a further understanding of people's rationale. So like we mentioned, in the future, it would be good to either have people taking notes or having some kind of video or audio recording of the actual process of sorting and having people um, ask questions um, as the study was being conducted. Okay, and here are some of the general challenges we're trying to figure out in our UX working group at Knative. So in terms of um, onboarding new design contributors, um, there is like challenges in like technical knowledge gaps. So we found that having synchronous meeting has really synchronous meetings has really helped this, especially um, like in the cloud development space. There are a lot of technical concepts, so having a lot of communication between developers and designers has been really helpful. The second major challenge that we're still trying to figure out is in terms of tracking non-code contributions on GitHub. So um, this this is a pretty major challenge, and we're still figuring out the procedure for this. Something that we've been doing so far is that whenever there is um, like a, des a new design issue. So we'll open an issue on GitHub and then the designer, once they've come up with their design, will open a pull request. And within that pull request, we'll either have uh, a PNG image of the design or a link to a Figma file. And then people can approve that pull request when that design change has been approved. So that's what we're doing currently, but we're still like exploring other ways to do all this. Um, and lastly, we are still doing some <laughs> Uh, exploration about potential design tools to use. So like I mentioned, Figma, it's a pretty common tool in the design space, but unfortunately it does have a paid license. So we're trying to figure out ways to give our open source contributors um, access to tools uh, that are free so that they don't have to pay money to do open source contribution. Okay, so um, you also might be wondering why designers would even want to participate in your open source projects. So there actually are um, a whole bunch of reasons. The first reason is that designers really um, enjoy seeing their changes implemented in an actual deploy deployed product. Um, and it's something really great that they can add to their design portfolio. Um, a lot of people are also interested in improving their technical knowledge, so that's another benefit. And lastly, um, they may actually want to help make software tools more accessible, um, and this way uh, more people get to have a say in the features and improvements for the tools. Um, and last, lastly, open source is, is an amazing community, and we've had a really good experience with it so far. Okay, so um, hopefully by this point you're like, oh wow, I want to start my own uh, UX research team and my own project. So here are some ways that you can go about doing that. The first is that you could find a organization with an existing designer demographic to partner with. So you could find um, a school or a research lab or even a local community meetup group and you can start talking to designers there. Um, the next step is something that we are um, hoping to look into ourselves is to start hosting more design events. So for example, you could have a design-a-thon and get different people from the design community um, aware of the problems in open source and get them involved. 
And um, yeah, from our experience, we definitely recommend having regular synchronous meetings, um, especially uh, for the purpose of sh uh, developing a shared vocabulary and learning what tools each group is using. And uh, yeah, so if you do end up onboarding some designers, you might need to give them some guidance on how to nav navigate GitHub. And here are some of our ongoing and future projects in our working group. So um, the one that a lot of people are very excited about is our mascot. Okay, thanks. <laughs> is our mascot. So this is our mascot, Quack, which we had the pleasure to redesign recently. Um, so uh, that's him. Um, and yeah, besides that, we also have been doing some website redesign. So the version on the left is the old version, and the version on the right is um, a new proposed version that we're still implementing um, and deploying. And uh, besides that, we're also working on a mobile version of the Canadian website. And we're also hopefully going to be developing or starting development on a graphical user interface for Knative pretty soon. Um, and lastly, we have a com contributor experience and retention rate study that we are currently doing as well. Okay, so I want to give a huge thank you to um, our team. So both our team at OCAD from the Perceptual Artifacts Lab and also everybody from Knative who's helped us with all of our projects um, and also these lovely people. And uh, we also want to give a call to action. So if you have ever used Knative or have any ideas for uh, new features, we would love to hear from you. So Quack the Knative Duck invites you to participate in our UX study. Um, the link is here. So um, I'll come back to the slide in just a second. Um, I just wanted to go to the next slide. So, and lastly, we want to invite you guys to get in touch with us. So, you can connect with us either on LinkedIn or via email. And I'm also going to be at the Knative booth after this presentation. So, we'd love to talk to you about getting designers involved in your own projects as well. Okay. And these are our sources. So, yeah, thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, hello? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for the talk, it was very nice. Um, I was just wondering when you ask um, people at the booth to hold these kind of uh, card sorting exercises, you say to educate them about uh, guided, not using guided questions. Can you give examples of what good questions would be? Oh, yes, that's a great question. Um, so a good example might be like, oh, don't you think these two should be categorized together? Or maybe like almost like incriminating questions. Like um, it also has to do with tone. Like, oh, really? Like you think those two should go together? Um, like that kind of thing might make users like, or participants second guess themselves and then maybe bias towards uh, like changing their answers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so be careful. Also, I want to make sure, so were you asking about biased questions or like questions to help with research, like useful questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so Marianne gave an example of like a biased, biased approach <laughs> to asking questions and maybe like uh, you want to ask kind of open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if you have two categories that the group together is like, oh, like, what do these two categories have in common? Or like, oh. where have you seen these two categories before? So just kind of like approaching it with curiosity um, and keeping it open-ended. And yet, what you don't want to do is like, don't you think that this one should be over there? <laughs> like, you, you don't want to ask those kinds of questions. Um, but yeah, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, OK, great. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you have a chance to measure the impact of your changes in the uh, in the menu? That is a great question. Uh, we definitely want to um, look at like a user test maybe to see how effective, like that's the last step in the design process. Um, we haven't gotten around to that portion, but absolutely we do want to do that. Um, so the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> And something that we might actually be doing is that um, for people that we are asking to participate in this study, um, depending on who signs up, uh, we might ask people to like take a look at the new documentation and comment on whether it's more or less helpful than the old one. Um, so that's the one way that we might approach the testing part of the design process.
Um, do you have any comments on using, for example, uh, some kind of AI into the documentation for, for users if maybe I'm not certain I made, I'm not like looking for a specific word or something, just like have an overall question about this documentation. And sometimes the, the, the search engine is not the best way sometimes to search for things that I'm not certain how to ask. And maybe I've seen some other places where you just like ask the AI bot and the AI bot looks around the documentation and gives you an answer. Yeah, we haven't um, looked into any like chat bot style features for any kind. I mean, as, as far as we know for like specific to documentation question chat bot stuff, um, but that could be, if, if there's enough interest, that could be a potential future project. Um, do, you have any thoughts? do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think that's actually a great suggestion and definitely something we could look into, but it didn't necessarily come up during the study, um, I guess because we were asking like on a very um, specific part of the documentation um, and like card sorting, maybe during an interview it would have come up. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I could see a lot of benefit in that. I think probably something that is more of a short-term goal would be to have like a search bar feature so you could search up certain words um, in the documentation as a whole. So we could implement that. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Um, so for your example for Knative, uh, the menu was already there and categories were already there. But let's say we're starting from scratch. Uh, what would be your idea of defining categories or how many um, categories should we even have in the menu? Um, yep, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Or Zainab, do you want to tackle the? You can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is maybe where the different types of card sorting could be helpful um, and also some like some like old cognitive science studies uh, suggest for example seven pieces of information so you could maybe try to aim for seven high level categories um, seven i think it's like plus two or minus two um, and you can start off with that and you could do a type of card sorting which is a lot more open. So for example, you provide the users with the seven categories that you're thinking of and then you ask them to fill it out for you. Um, that one can be a bit trickier and maybe demands more time uh, than this kind of card sorting, but uh, yeah, that might be helpful. I think also for that situation, your users would have to be um, more familiar with the domain as well. Like maybe they've used other tools or they have like expertise. So you could definitely, I would probably start with like more of like a, if you're like a non-technical person doing kind of like an open-ended discussion-based interview, be like, oh, like what kinds of information do you typically put in documentation? And then like, once you have like a conversation, you could pick out keywords from that conversation as well. And that could go onto your cards as well. Yeah. Good. Thank you guys so Thanks much. Everyone.